Hello, everyone. Welcome to Meet Magento New York. It's a pleasure to be here reunited together after three years in person. We believe that people are at the heart of every payment. Just like money is the currency of every transaction, trust is the currency of every interaction. And every time you take out your credit card to make a payment online, you're actually making a leap of faith. Will my credentials get compromised? Will my payment go through? These are a couple of the concerns that we want to discuss in today's session. What's worrying the retail industry? And one of the things that I always like to do whenever I'm worrying is to focus on the things that are within your control. My name is Stephanie, and I work on the partnerships team at Checkout.com. In fact, ever since I was a little, a little girl, just to give you some background on my path to payments, my mom used to tell me that when we would go on shopping trips, I was always super preoccupied with how cash registers worked. My first job in high school was working in uh, medical billing and tracking down health care payments, and then I went on to spend over a decade working at um, the largest bank in America. And so it seems like, looking back on it, you know, my, my career was almost destined to work in payments. And it's also my great honor to be sharing the stage with my colleague and mentor, Yael. Um, Yael has spent over 15 years building global payment solutions. And um, it's, it's so exciting and, and a great treat to have her share the stage with us today because she's one of the smartest people I know. And she has a, a wealth of knowledge to really bring to us today on payments. Um, you know, I, I'm excited that she'll be able to share her philosophy on payments, which I'll call her paylosophy. So after my brief um, presentation, um, we'll share the stage together to do um, a brief Q&A. So often overlooked and underestimated in a company's tech stack is their payments. And how a merchant handles payments can really make or break the underlying customer experience. Whether it's a failed, a failed, a false decline, a clunky form, if it's uh, manually filling in your credit card details or a really delayed web page load at checkout, these are just a couple of the reasons for why merchants are losing out on viable revenue. That's why at checkout, we believe that the best payment experiences are invisible. They're painless. They're barely perceptible. In fact, that's probably a reason why you've never heard of Checkout.com. Um, we're a fintech company that is a global payments provider, a full modern payment stack that combines both the gateway, the acquiring, and the processing. And we exist to serve merchants like Adidas, Netflix, and Sony. But to truly understand payments, we have to understand consumers, without whom there would be no payments at all. And so over the summer, Checkout tirelessly interviewed over 9,000 consumers and 500 retailers across the world. And I'm so excited to be able to share these findings with you, which was actually just released and hot off the press yesterday. We'll also give you the opportunity at the end of this session to download the guide yourself. So our main finding shows really a tension for retailers operating in the current economic environment. It should come as no surprise. Two in three global consumers shop online several times a month or more. For me, that's you know, several times a week or more. <laughs> and 81% of consumers say that the, t the future of retail is online. This is actually up 10% from last year. So these metrics are really good news for retailers that have already significantly invested in, in, in their e-commerce platform. On the other hand, what we're hearing is that over half of Americans are planning to cut their non-essential spend online this year due to financial constraints. Furthermore, about a third are only shopping online and their primary motivation for this is to search for better deals and options. On the other hand, we also have retailers who are facing a similar tension. While they have ambitious growth plans, 
76% are worried about their financial health. Almost all of them say that the need to pass on price hikes would pose a risk to their business. And what's most surprising is that 25% of them are still going to do it anyway. So where does this leave us? To kind of summarize the market dynamics, on the one hand, you have consumers that are optimistic about e-commerce, but planning to cut their spend. And on the other hand, you have retailers who have these ambitious growth plans, but um, you know, are facing margin compression costs and rising acquisition, uh, sorry, mar margin compression and rising consumer acquis customer acquisition costs. So with that in mind, we've kind of set the stage here. I'd like to invite my colleague Yael to the stage um, to hear a little bit more about what's worrying the retail industry. And I'll put up on the screen here. Um, this is the QR code to, um, to download our guide. Yael, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, why don't we kick it off, if you can just tell us a little bit more about your background. Um, and your role at Checkout.com. Of course. And hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I have been working in payments for the better part of the last 15 years. I actually started on the merchant side. I was working for businesses who were implementing payments. So I was seeing, uh, you know, basically the world through your eyes. And uh, I was so fascinated with the global nature of payments, with the scalability of it, that I decided to move over to the other side, on the payments provider side. And I always felt that my early days in payments gave me uh, an interesting perspective and definitely the empathy to my customer, the merchant, the businesses that we work with every day. Um, over the last uh, 15 years, as Ms. Stephanie mentioned in the beginning, I, I had the opportunity to work on solutions at the core of processing, like you know, core gateway and credit cards and alternate payment methods, but also vertical specific uh, industries like marketplaces and online gaming and different risk types of uh, risk type uh, verticals. So um, today at Checkout, I've been at Checkout for a couple of years now. Uh, I focus a lot on solutions for marketplaces, also online retailers, recurring billing, um, and global solutions in general, since we are a global, um, global platform. It's nice. a pleasure to be with you today. So why don't we kick off and just dig right into it. Yeah, what would you say are some of the top of mind challenges for, for some of retailers and consumers right now? So I think you, you pretty much mentioned everything, and, and none of these should be surprises to us, right? Because we're, we're all, even though we're here in our professional capacity, we're also people with lives, and we also are feeling, uh, you know, financial constraints, and, and we, are, we are just as, as pressed to optimize our spend and, um, as, as any consumer out there. So I think, oh. I'm being told to, <laughs> to get more intimate oh. here. Uh, <laughs> so I think, um, yes, I definitely identify with the findings of the survey where on the one hand, uh, consumers are, are saying, we're going to control our spend, and businesses are saying, well, we have higher costs and we need to hike the prices, but we know if we do that, then obviously we're reducing um, the appeal of, of, our, of our business. So um, the things that I think about when, I, when I'm thinking, how, how can we help our customers or businesses in general address these concerns is, first of all, as, as a business, you do so much to acquire customers. You spend so much money on bringing that customer into your business, whether it's online or in the store. And of course, um, all, that, all that conversion funnel, once you get to that final moment of truth where, some, where a consumer has to actually take out their wallet and pay for something, you want to make sure that you give yourself the best chance to convert that consumer, just like you do with your SEO spending um, and, your, and your, navig um, your website optimization. And so for me, what I think about is guaranteeing, again, that once that consumer is ready to pay, we give you the best chance to convert that consumer, but also that we give you that best chance to do so at the least cost, because one way to fight you know, margin compression is hike price, but another way is to lower your cost. So uh, the things that we think about, first of all, at the front end of a transaction is, of course, how do we let you accept the right forms of payments? And you know, previous uh, session here from our friends at PayPal addressed that. Um, and also, how do we help you prevent things like fraud up front, whether it's 
true fraud, like you know, bad actors, you don't want to accept a transaction, and whether it's friendly fraud, because maybe it's someone who has a history of charging back uh, even though they do accept a product. So these things are, uh, are, are cost controlling measures, right? Um, at the same time, how do we help you lower the cost of a transaction itself by either routing to uh, through payment rails that have a lower cost? And these are things, honestly, that you guys as businesses don't need, shouldn't need to think about. These should come out of the box from the provider that you work with because they're thinking of it on your behalf. If you are uh, accepting a debit card payment, is your provider routing it? And there's ways that they can do it. I don't need to. I don't need to. You know. Um, confuse you with pay geek, but there's ways to write a transaction that'll result in a lower cost to a transaction, and that lower cost should be passed down to you uh, in the pricing that you get from them. And so these are the things that, that I think about. How, do, how can we help our customers achieve that last mile, uh, both at the highest conversion and the lowest cost? Thank you for sharing that. Um, what are your thoughts, Yael, on different ways, if we can get into the specifics now, around how retailers can optimize conversion? You know, this is obviously a really big topic, and you know, it seems like within the Meet Magento community, um, we have a lot of people that love to tinker with data. Mm. How can we get into the specifics of things that retailers can do to optimize their conversion? Sure, and any one of you that has someone in your operations that's in charge of payments, I'm sure they're, they're gonna understand this and, and probably love this. Um, there is a lot of data that is available to you uh, when you process a transaction. There's of course um, data around who the customer is that, that, that you have, but there's also data that might come back from services like um, identity verification or fraud detection that your payments provider is running for you that helps you take decisions, again, on whether or not you want to accept a transaction. Um, at the same time, there's data around what happened to the transaction. If a transaction failed for some reason, uh, if it failed because uh, a card is expired or a card is canceled, uh, what should you do about it? And, uh, and data comes back to you in real time and in a form of reports. So again, a payments provider uh, should be able to provide to you some responses in real time that you can act upon. If, if it's a customer whose card is expired, of course, um, requesting a new, uh, a new or alternate payment method from that customer uh, is something you wanna do. And also, um, just talking about expired cards and cards that you know uh, might need updating, there are features and services today, both from payments providers and from, from the schemes themselves, from Visa, MasterCard, that will allow you to keep your cards on file constantly updated. Uh, and again, talk to your payments provider about that, because there's, if, if you have a, um, a card on file that is constantly up to date, uh, even when it expires, even when someone renews their card, then you don't have to go through that friction journey of asking your customer, hey, give me your new card because your, new, your old card is expired. And most of uh, big enterprises today are, are already doing this. Uh, anyone that's in a recurring billing model should be thinking about that, should be talking to your payments provider about uh, network tokenization or about tokenization in general and account updating. Account updater is the name of the service. Thanks for sharing some of your thoughts around optimization um, improvements. You know, it's, it's fascinating that, you know, in the, even in the world of response codes, certain payment service providers can provide up to 150 different reasons for why your credit card was declined. That, that's true, and, and, you know, with data, there's always uh, how much is too much and how much, is, how much do I want that's actionable, right? From, I can say from, from you know, to us uh, as a payments provider from the schemes and the different um, downstream providers that we work, we'll get hundreds and thousands of different reason codes. And we too take decisions on what reason codes are meaningful to pass as is to our customers because they're actionable and what reason codes maybe should be lumped into uh, one group that says, forget about this payment, it's never gonna pass, just you know, don't waste time here. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's, it's how we optimize actually our system so that our, our customers, our businesses that work with us um, can be efficient. We wanna pass to them actionable data and we wanna protect them from noise. 
Sounds like a lot of fine tuning that needs to happen. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other themes that I wanted to talk about, Yael, was um, obviously e-commerce is becoming increasingly cross-border. I mean, over 20% of e-commerce flows now are, are overseas. And as a lot of enterprises continue to expand um, internationally, what are some things that they need to consider from enabling alternative or local payment methods? We know that there's a lot of them. I mean, you're, you're a fish dead out of water, for example, if you don't mm -hmm. offer ideal in the Netherlands. Um, but what would you say to merchants that are considering different payment methods and how they should offer them also to help improve optimization and conversion? Sorry, conversion. Yeah. So a few years ago, I saw a TED talk about uh, choice and, and how human beings um, deal with choice, how it affects us. And, and you know, just to paraphrase, the conclusion was that human beings like choice, but human beings get stuck in analysis paralysis when they have too much choice. So I think I, I kind of think about it similarly when I think about different payment methods because, um, again, as, as mentioned in the previous conversation uh, here, we all have two, three payment methods that we like to use in different circumstances. Uh, I have my debit card, my credit card, and my favorite e-wallet, you know. Um, and and, and I'll basically not venture out of these three. In some countries in the world, there might be six or seven payment methods that that will give you that 100% coverage of the market. However, if you look at data, you will always find that two or three of those will give you the optimal coverage in terms of pretty much everyone in that market will have that payment method. And very few, a small percentage in that market might not think that that's one of their favorites. So it's kind of an optimization between you want to have the right payment methods for coverage, um, but you don't want to have too many. too many because that will basically actually drive your consumers, your customers into, into analysis paralysis. And, um, and so again, solutions like uh, either uh, smart detection by, by your checkout provider, your hosted checkout or, or shopping cart provider of where your customer is and therefore maybe taking some decisions on, on which payment methods to offer up that customer. Those are things that we're starting to see. Uh, come up as value-add features with, with different payments providers. Um, and, and I think um, you guys all should all have access to the data from your payments providers. A payment provider should be a consultant to you. These are the most important in that market um, and probably at that order, for example. Uh, and then you, you can either take the decision yourself or you can get help from them um, in positioning those payment methods within your cards. These are all really good recommendations on how to think a little bit more strategically about payments. Um, yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't <laughs> talk about one of your favorite topics, which is marketplaces. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and I think you know we've seen obviously in you know Amazon's and Walmart's earnings reports lately that the the proliferation of third-party sellers on marketplaces is um, is a trend that is taking over e-commerce. Um, you know, and I think in chapter six of our handbook, actually, we touch a little bit on this and how yes. you know there's over a hundred marketplace marketplace websites right now that are racking in over $2 trillion. Like, tell us a little bit more yeah. about some of the, the things yeah. to look out for with marketplaces. Absolutely. I'll go even further. I read a study not long ago that suggested that in some categories, uh, over the next five years, marketplaces will overtake uh, retailers. Mm. So uh, definitely the rise of, of marketplace is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And um, what we see, and I think also this is a trend that was already in the play, but definitely accelerated by pandemic that sent everyone, all consumers, you know, in front of their desks shopping and comparing. Right. And when you start comparing, you know, uh, comparing from, let's say, uh, one brand to another, that's a little hard. When all the brands are put in front of you on one platform, on that marketplace platform, now as a consumer, you are getting, you know, you're curated. Uh, shopping experience. And I think that is uh, a lot of what's behind the rise of marketplaces. It's convenient. As a consumer, I'm feeling like it's an easier way to shop for the best deals. Uh, and most of the brands are also available to me in the marketplace setting rather than if I go to each of them uh, separately. Um, it might be considered as a threat to maybe some of the businesses here who are running, of course, their own um, proprietary brand. But what we're seeing is um, some of our customers, for example, 
uh, are starting to launch marketplaces even within their own proprietary brand. Um, we have a customer in, in France who is a, a fashion retailer. Uh, they sell their own uh, mark, their own, their own brand, but they also started a, a third-party marketplace similar to Walmart, similar to Amazon, uh, on their website as well as a way to, of attracting consumers into their website. Uh, yes, they probably give up some of their sales to those third parties, but at the same time, um, they are now more appealing to, to those consumers who are looking for choice. Um, there's also a sustainability uh, aspect to marketplaces that consumers seem to be appreciating more and more. And uh, if you have uh, read about H&M starting their um, secondhand marketplace, for example, uh, online, that's, that's a... That, that's, a, 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 again, a way for, for brands to connect with consumer sentiment around sustainability and the need to recycle. So, so, so definitely, I mean, to, maybe to look back on the beginning, more and more marketplace, for sure, uh, is, is popping up. But uh, it doesn't mean that brands who aren't marketplaces themselves can't leverage that trend as well can't connect with maybe spinning up um, a marketplace themselves alongside their own brand or even listing their products on a, uh, on a marketplace as well. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing your insights on marketplaces. Sure. One other question that I have, I mean, just kind of thinking about the time, you know, it's the start of fall. We have one week left until Q4 begins mm -hmm. and holiday season is, is just upon us as, as was acknowledged in the session before this. Um, do you have any recommendations on what retailers can do to prepare for the holiday season? Often a peak time, you know, in payments where, you know, for, for many retailers it, it, can, it can make the year. And so we'd love to yeah. hear your thoughts on, on what companies can do from a payments perspective to yeah. prepare for, for Q4. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything about logistics and, <laughs> and, uh, and merchandising because you're the experts in that. But definitely on the payment side, I can tell you every payments company out there is prepping for, you know, pretty much from, I think, a Singles Day in China, mm -hmm. right, and November 11th, all the way to, uh, to after Christmas. For us, first of all, it's about ensuring that our systems, our platforms are uh, scalable and available to you guys so that when your sales start peaking, uh, there is no downtime. Uh, you know, we see transactions peak to a thousand transactions in a second, more than that sometimes during certain days. Um, and so, uh, of course, uh, one of the things that one of the ways we prepare is making sure that that our systems are hardened and able to take all that extra load. Of course, on the on the business side, on the merchant side, what I would say is make sure your uh, your fraud fighting, um, your your fraud detection and, and your fraud prevention systems are up to date, and, and maybe it's a good time to take a look at those scrubbing rules that you might be running or not running. If you're not running, maybe you should be running. Um, What's that? Uh, fraud scrub. So, you know, anyone who is trying to fight fraud will tell you that they will look at certain behaviors of consumers and uh, try to uh, try to make decisions on whether or not a transaction is fraudulent or not. You know, um, amount-based, location-based, uh, even product type. Does it make sense? And and most payments providers out there will will give you that uh, at least basic capability out of the box, if not some extended value-added type. Uh, fraud detection service, um, optimizing on your, of course, uh, of course, checkouts with uh, the right payment methods. Everything that that we've been talking about is heightened uh, during this holiday, uh, the, the pre-holiday season. Yeah, yeah, sounds like a lot of things uh, to yes. think about. <laughs> um, I think it might also be interesting to talk and double-click into the fraud topic that you had just mentioned. Um, you know, strong customer uh, authentication is obviously something that's really big in Europe, and mm -hmm. it seems like it's coming to the U.S. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm actually, you know, the last. <laughs> I think anyone in payments on our side will tell you that the last couple of years have years have been painful because we all have had to migrate from uh, one type of authentication called 3DS1 to a new type of authentication called 3DS2, right? Which uh, represented a big technical overhead, but now that it's done, and for us, thank God it's done, um, we are in a position where our, our uh, customers, our merchant businesses, are able to more efficiently and uh, in a better way towards consumers, and I'll explain in a second, 
uh, scrub for fraud in terms of um, uh, validating the uh, the authenticity of a transaction. So, if you all uh, you all I'm sure have been through a process where I don't know if a few years ago you might have shopped online and then you got redirected to a little window that had the Visa logo on it and it asked you for a password and mm -hmm. maybe you know your password maybe you don't know your password and then a couple years later it actually texted you your password or you texted you a code that you need to put in to. Con to complete that transaction, that's not a fun experience. That's what used to be called 3DS1. Um, and today, with 3DS2, uh, when we are in a position where a customer has to be challenged, is what we call it, because we're not sure, for example, if uh, the cardholder is truly who he says he is or uh, if the card truly is legitimate, then there are things that a payments provider can do to pass along data that they already have within the transaction information or data that the merchant business can pass along to, um, to the payments provider that we can we then pass it along to Visa, MasterCard, and to the issuer of the card. And that issuer can give us um, an, an, automated, uh, an automated response, basically, to say this is legit or not legit. And when they do that, you get the same uh, liability coverage for chargebacks as, as you're used to with 3DS1, meaning the customer cannot call back and say this was fraud, this wasn't me. Um, when customer does need to authenticate themselves, so we pass all this data to you know, Visa, MasterCard, they come back and they say, ah, we're not so sure yet, then uh, this new protocol allows customers to authenticate themselves with things like uh, biometrics, for example, um, better experiences than do you remember a password that you, used, that you set up when you, you know, signed up for this card five years ago. So uh, there are better tools now to um, to fight fraud um, with that ability to authenticate and on a better user journey for the customer. Wow. You certainly have given us a lot to think about today, Yael. Thank you for being so generous with your knowledge. We're going to open up the floor to questions, but you know, I think you know, today's session just reminds me that there's a lot for retailers to think about. Um, everything that you've talked about from conversion optimization to optimizing how granular your data can be um, and as well as um, authenticating you know who who the, um, the, the the user is when making a payment so thank you so much and with that let's open up the floor to questions any questions First, I wanted to compliment the ladies. You did such a fabulous job. I was taking notes uh, and, and pictures. So thank you for a wonderfully engaging discussion. Wanted to ask just your perceptions about uh, how you see the global market. As you said, card processing is a huge deal in Northern America, but then we're seeing just exciting payment trends mm -hmm. uh, across the world. So, uh, and I was reading through the brief that, that you put up as well. Um, are you observing, based on your interactions with merchants, how they're showing up differently in Europe versus North America, maybe potentially versus um, Asia, Africa, et cetera? And if you have any insights that you could share with us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you mentioned uh, in your talk, uh, some, some regions of the world have seemed to leapfrog over uh, mm -hmm. From, from cash over to digital, and that's definitely true in Asia, where we see, uh, I'm sure like you do, the pro proliferation of uh, e-wallets, e super apps, yeah. uh, you know, in India, where someone basically runs their life from through one app, um, and not having to go outside of that app for anything, you know, shopping, groceries, insurance, banking, and bill payment, uh, all in one app. Uh, and definitely in Africa, where mobile payments has, has pretty much, uh, I think, stepped into a void in, in what wasn't there, which was standard banking rails. People did, had, didn't have access to you know, your, your, your average bank account. So what do you do? Right. Well, you, you do have access to a phone. Uh, yeah. And how can we use the phone as, uh, as that alternate uh, to banking? Right. I also think about crypto a little bit that way. You know, uh, there are limits to our banking uh, rails. It takes time to move money across borders. Uh, it's expensive, and suddenly we have this alternate, you know, network that still needs yes, some some hardening and maybe some regulation around it. But as a potential, it's a way to move money instantly around the world move value instantly around the world. So all of these things, we're definitely noticing that. We're definitely, you know, um, as a company, we, we released some products around stablecoin settlement earlier this year to, to address some of these challenges of 
how can we uh, you know, and enable our customers to make use of these new technologies? Uh, on the retail space, for sure, in Asia, yes, we, we, see the, we absolutely see the need to enable all of these e-wallets and, um, and, and how they are, they're more prevalent than cards. People don't care so much about the card experience in Asia. Uh, you know, in Europe, people don't love cards. They don't trust cards. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely something we're observing as well. Yeah, as a foil to what you said before, you know, with certain countries, you know, enabling phone as the predominant method of payment, um, you know, it's, it's a complete uh, contrast to in Europe where, you know, bank transfers are the most popular yes. form of payment. Uh, yeah. um, you know, so you have those to think about. In the U.S., obviously, credit card are, are the most popular, but there's so many different forms of payments to think about. I, I mean, um, it's a great question, and we can spend so much time <laughs> digging into it because every single country has their own cultural, regulatory, political even, um, nuances that all affect why a certain payment method um, prevails. Um, so great question, and thank you for that. I, I think, you know, the again, to make a shameless plug for our Global Retailers Handbook, I think um, what I love about it is that it also segments the data into, I think, eight or nine different countries, and we'll talk a little bit about the trends and themes we're seeing a little bit on a, on a more specific basis. So um, would love to chat more a little bit after if you're interested. Any other questions? Yes. Can you touch a little bit on your analysis of uh, the subscription? Uh, you mentioned in the handbook it, it's kind of trending down to people cut expenses. We're also seeing an increase in opportunity there on the business side. So is that a trend you see continue? Yeah, subscriptions is an interesting trend, I think, to say the least. You know, on the one hand, um, I think Zora put out this analysis on their subscriptions economic index where over the past 10 years, I believe subscriptions businesses have outperformed the S&P 500 five times. Um, so I think, you know, when you do a historical look back, you know, subscriptions have really outperformed in a number of ways. Um, but going forward, you know, I think to a lot of the points that Yella had made around um, conversion, and I think, you know, with consumers now, doing so much comparison shopping. You know, it's it's very difficult to say how sticky a lot of these subscription relationships will be. I think my, actually I'm gonna draw on my own personal experience in life. I've definitely seen the tipping over of subscription models to, it's it's illogical at this point. Like, I'm, I'm happily, you know, I'll pay for my Netflix because it's a monthly thing that I, you know, it makes sense to me. But I have seen landscaping services go recurring where I, I get their service twice a year, you know. and But they're trying to, of course, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to generate recurring business. And so, so I think, Maybe that's a little bit what's happening. Everyone wants to go recurring because, of course, it's a way to, to, to guarantee yeah. a steady a steady cash flow and, and income. But some, maybe some categories are just not subscription worthy, you know. Um, and and I think that's that might be a little bit what's on consumers' minds as as they're looking at their statements, going like all these things, you know. I definitely look at my statement every month and, and say, wow, I didn't know I, my, my subscriptions are, you know, they're, they're growing, they're not, they're not getting smaller. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to think about, I think, when it comes to the world of subscriptions and, and how to analyze both sources of voluntary and involuntary churn. Um, there's a lot of data that you can look into in comparing cohorts in terms of the frequency and the monetary and um, the velocity even of their purchases over time to make predictions using like machine learning about what their propensity and likelihood is of continuing that subscription in the future. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, with what the future holds. That's probably how I would answer that. Any other questions? So I I I will caveat this by saying 3DS is I'm probably the the 80% expert, I'm not the 100%, <laughs> but I can definitely. Um, so what I know, you know, and definitely um, 
uh, what, what we work with our merchants to do with 3DS 2 and 2.2 now, um, is that the, uh, through um, transaction risk analysis, um, there are certain, uh, the acquirers themselves, uh, if the acquirer that you work with is under a certain th uh, threshold of fraud, then issuers will give the acquirer more credibility in their transaction, right? So you're, you have a higher chance uh, of getting your transactions approved. And so as an acquirer, what we do is obviously, it's, it's also in our interest to lower fraud, but we work with our merchants to make sure that they feed us all the right data so that we can push it down to issuers. So uh, we give the issuer the best chance to approve the transaction and therefore for the merchant to approve the transaction. White uh, um, labeling, oh, not white labeling, but um, URLs, white listing URLs, that I haven't heard of, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I need to check. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your question. Any others? So that's a wrap. A good, uh, <laughs> a, a, a good transition to lunch. Thank you. Uh, so thank thank you very much, Yael and Stephanie, for such an insightful presentation. Feel free, feel free to come and talk to them, ask them more questions uh, at their booth. And we'll be back at 2 o'clock after lunch. Oh, thank man, you. Nailed it. <laughs> that was great.